Here's the State of the Collection 2025 edition. It feels like I just did this a couple of months ago, but I checked and it's been almost three and a half years since I gave a State of the Collection video. Now, my perception is that things have gotten a lot tighter. Somebody counted the ones in the last video, 41 telescopes or so. My perception is that number has gone down by quite a bit, but I haven't done a scope count, so let's find out together how many there are. So let's start with the two telescopes behind me here. This one is the model number 591 from 1981 by Mead. I got a job at a fast food restaurant at sub-minimum wage. Minimum wage was $3.35 an hour at the time. They paid me $2.85, and by the time you figure in gas money and insurance and other expenses, it was really slow going, fig saving up that $319 to buy that thing. So much so that I couldn't afford to wait to save up the extra $60 to get the normal model number 628. This is sort of a lightweight, less expensive version. I don't think there's a lot of difference between them, having played with these through the years. The one thing is the paint that they used on the model number 591 was really cheap. It started peeling right away and it hasn't stopped since. The other one is the model 826, that's the 8-inch F6. That's the one I wanted at the time, but having bought one of these now, I got this used a few years ago, they use the same mount for the 6 and the 8. It's a time-honored tradition in our hobby that I really wish they would stop doing. The 8 is a little bit too heavy for that mount. I really think the 6-inch is the one to get in that range. So I move this one into the frame here. This is the Mead model number 645 from about the same period, early 1980s, 6-inch F5 Newtonian. Short, fast Newtonians are common today, but back then this was pretty unusual to see something like this, and it was like $389 at the time in 1981, 1982. And by the way, take all of these numbers on these vintage scopes, multiply them by about four to get what those values are today in 2025. So these were pretty serious investments for anybody looking to get a telescope. So here are the Takahashis. There are four of them here. This is the FS60. This is not the same as the one you're going to see later. I have two of these. This one is set up for visual observing. The other one is set up just for imaging. Yes, I like this telescope that much. I have two of them. This is the FC76. This is the older version, not the new one. Here's the Sky90 and the FS102. Now, of these four, the one that's probably the most problematical is, of course, the Sky 90. The lens cell collimation is odd. The quality control is a little bit odd in this model. I have an affection for this. Kind of hard to justify buying one of these at the cost that they ask for these, but I got this one at a very good price, so it stays in the collection. I'm often asked which one of these is my favorite, and there's no question here, it is this one, the FC76. It just does everything except gather a lot of light. Some of my best lunar and planetary images were taken with this FC76. It's small enough to take it with me anywhere, and it didn't cost that much because it is one of the older models. If you find one of these for sale in your area at an attractive price and you like good refractors, think about getting it. Here are the Maxitovs, instantly recognizable due to their deeply curved meniscus lenses and the aluminized spots on the secondary. Over here we have a Questar. This is a deforked duplex model, I think from around 1978, based on the serial number that is etched on the bottom. On the other side here, we have this Skywatcher, Skymax 102. This is a very good telescope. I have a review of one of these. I should be using this thing a lot more often. And in fact, you know, if I was running out the door and I had to grab a Maxitov without thinking about it, I think I'd probably take that one. Yes, I know. I'm not supposed to say that because this guy is over here. But yes, that's the one I would take if I had to use a Maxitov right now. In the middle here, we have the three ETXs, and here's a case where I think I've done a lot better in getting the collection down. I used to have way more of these, too many for one person. This is the most donated model to me, and I'm not accepting any more of these. I've got the collection down to a point where it's manageable. Over here, we have a deforked ETX-90. We have an ETX-90 original version still on its drive base. This is the non-go-to version. 
and we have a ETX-125 also deforked, and this one has been modified. This thing has outstanding optics. It's one of the better telescopes that I have. One problem that it has is it's got quite a bit of image shift. So I had a friend take the visual back off and put this on here. This is a Crayford focuser, and that gets rid of the problem with the image shift. You sort of rough focus with the original focuser, and then you fine focus with this. It works very well. And I think, um, you know, I think we're supposed to call this cosmetically challenged. Ugly is what it is, but you don't look at it, you look through it, and it is, gives very pleasing views and even good images of the moon and of the planets. And by the way, here is the original visual back off this thing, and I don't know if you can see this, but it's a cheap piece of plastic. This diagonal mirror here, this mechanism isn't very good, and it's the same thing on the 90s, so I keep this around to show people just how cheaply these things are made. So like I say, I'm done collecting ETXs, no more of these, I'm not getting any more ETXs. Except, you know, I don't have the 105. If I had the 105, I'd have at least all the Maxitov ETXs, so I may get one of those. But that's it. No more ETXs. I'm not getting any more. I'm done collecting ETXs. Except maybe for a 105. Here are two Mead Research Grade Newtonians. This is the model number 880, and that's the model number 1060. It's the 8-inch and the 10-inch. So the 8 I got pretty much complete off Craigslist, and it looks pretty much the way it looks in the catalog. The 10, not so much. This is the one that I picked up. It looked like a telescope-shaped piece of rust that had been sitting outside for a couple of decades, and it is under restoration right now. If you've been following it, yes, this has taken a long time. Scope Wizard has apologized. He says he's going to get to it, and I said, don't worry about it because I have to figure out where all this stuff is going. I may have to rearrange furniture in the house because I do want the two of these to be together. Now, someone has mentioned that since I have the 8 and the 10, I should go ahead and get the 12 and a half. I might do that. It's going to be a little bit easier because the hard part is done. The 10 is by far the most difficult of the ones to find. This is the only 10-inch research-grade mean Newtonian I have ever seen. Most of the ones I see do happen to be 12, so if I seek one out, it should be a little easier to find one of those. So here we have all of the Dobbs. We have the Orion X-T 4.5, the X-T 6, the X-T 8, which you've seen me talk about several times here, and the 12-inch Celestron Starhopper, if you followed me here. I don't particularly care for this model. And at the very end, we have, well, it's the poor Star Blaster, what's left of it. Those of you may know that we put these in libraries as the library telescope program. In the state of New Hampshire, we have something like 180 of these placed in libraries so far, and you can check them out like a book for two weeks. Unfortunately, with Orion going away, this has become problematical because these things fail, parts break and go missing, and so the ones that have been around the club like this one have been cannibalized for parts, and well, this poor thing is, it's missing its daub mount and it's missing some other parts, and I suspect by the time you see this video next, it may be gone altogether, but I feel sorry for it, so we're going to count this as part of the collection for now. All of these, of course, live under the shadow of the big 20-inch obsession. This is one of the telescopes that doesn't belong to me. The owner here has been leaving it here while he travels the country and travels the world, and I've had it for a couple of years now. Now, I've had some of these trees taken down, and I didn't realize just how bad my horizons were with all those tall trees. It's opened up quite a bit here, and I think I'm going to be using this thing more often. But for the past couple of years, when I've used this, it's mainly been from people wanting to visit and use one first before they decide if they're going to buy one for themselves. So I do have three dedicated deep sky imaging rigs. These are not for webcam lunar planetary, and they are not for nightscapes. These are strictly for deep sky. Over here we have the William Optics Red Cat 51. I have a review of this telescope elsewhere on this channel. Controlled by an ASI Air smart controller and a 2600 MC camera on the back, and there is an AM3 harmonic mount underneath. Over here we have a similar rig, upsized a little bit. This is the Astrophysics Stowaway, the 92mm f6.65, that is the latest version of the Stowaway. Again, controlled by an ASI Air Smart Controller and an ASI 2600MC camera, same as the other one, on the back, on the slightly larger AM5 harmonic mount. 
over here, I guess we could call this the legacy rig. <laughs> it still has its uses. This is a Takahashi FS60CB with a Hutec modded EOS 5D Mark III on the end on a standard AVX mount. No smart controller here. This is all done manually. But you see, I have these down pretty low to the ground. Again, since nobody's going to be looking through these telescopes, there's no point in raising them up too high. Might as well keep them low for stability. Although I may wind up purchasing the pier for the middle one, just so that we can get the, uh, the zenith a little bit better without having to worry about hitting the legs. So somebody pointed out here that there's not a lot of diversity here. I just went with a bunch of short focal length refractors and they would be correct. I don't know how I pigeonholed myself into this niche, but that's where I am. I'm gonna change that at some point. Maybe I will go with a Schmidt Newtonian, an imaging Newtonian, or perhaps an RC just as an experiment to see how that works out. Here are the Schmidt Cassegrains, and this is an area where I think things have gotten a lot better. I used to have a big collection of these. I've got these down to a core group that I think I'm very comfortable with. This is the Celestron C6. This is the one that actually gets used the most often. It's very versatile. It can go in a variety of different locations. This is the Dirty 8. If you followed me before, I, this thing showed up as a telescope-shaped piece of dirt on Mark's doorstep, and I spent several months restoring this. It is okay in its present shape. It'll never be a great telescope, but I kind of feel sorry for it, so it sticks around. Here is the 10-inch. This is probably one of the best telescopes I have. People raise an eyebrow when I say that, but yes, this has one of the best optics of any scope that I own. Those of you who know me well know that the Celestron C9 and a quarter is my favorite Schmidt Cassegrain. This is keeping me from buying one. It's redundant. And on the edge here, we have an 8-inch LX200 and a 12-inch LX200. If you're in the market for a used LX200, please do watch my LX200 buyer's guide before making any moves. I will link that in the description below. A mid-aperture reflector is like a good utility infielder. They can be pressed to service into any number of roles, and they're just helpful to have on your team. I have two of them here. This is the Celestron Omni 150. This is the 6-inch F5. This gets used a lot more than you might think, given its relatively modest cost. It goes to skywatches with me all the time. And over here, we have the Orion Observer 134, a terrific bargain from Orion. I'm glad I picked this up just before they went away. Here are two telescopes that I had a hand in making myself. This is a 6-inch f7.15 Dobsonian reflector. I ground the mirror, took me several months, and laid out the wooden pieces on a board, double-checked my work, and I took it to a club member named Joe, who's very good with woodworking, and then he pointed out all of the mistakes that I had made and wound up laying everything out all over again. Sorry about that, Joe. You were great. So 6-inch f7.15, if that sounds like an unusual f-ratio, well, of course, it is. I was going for a 6-inch f8, and I missed. Hey, sorry, it was my first mirror. Here is a 4-inch f8. I didn't make this mirror, but I got the optics at Neef. Somebody was selling some Russian optics in a nice little wooden case, and he was selling it for next to nothing. I got the optics, and then I laid the parts out again, having learned the lessons from here. And again, Joe pointed out all of the other mistakes that I had made. But like all Russian optics, it is outstanding. Much, much better than the four and a quarter inch F8 mirrors that you normally see out there. Here are two telescopes you should not be buying. This is the Celestron Power Seeker 127, one of the worst things you could possibly buy. And this is the Celestron Astromaster 130, which isn't much better. I have videos on both of these models explaining why you should not buy them. You do want to watch those in case one of these somehow winds up on your shopping list. Neither of these belong to me. They belong to club members who dropped them off and then mysteriously disappeared and have made no effort to pick them up. And here are the vintage refractors. This is the 60mm Tasco number 7TE, the 80mm Tasco number 10TE, the Takahashi TS65, an early Japanese acromat, and the big Unitron number 152 in the background. I don't know if this is coming across on video, but these are all quite beautiful. In fact, collecting vintage telescopes is a rabbit hole that you can go down very quickly. If you think I have a lot of telescopes, there are people I know 
who have more vintage telescopes than I have telescopes. One person described it as a collecting addiction. So here's some miscellaneous stuff that doesn't really fall under any one neat category. At the end here, we have the TASCO number 9VR. I talked about that in a previous video. Yes, it is a TASCO, but it's a Vixen branded TASCO, and that thing is actually pretty good, and it's even a minor collector's item. Have the very distinctive here, Edmund AstroScan, and Orion Short Tube 80. I have don't use this very much, and I've thought about selling this from time to time, but you know, with Orion no longer with us, this was their most popular model for many, many years, and I think I'm just going to hang on to this thing for sentimental reasons. I had a lot of these Galileo scopes. This is the plastic kit that was used for educational purposes. I gave most of them away, but in the basement I found I did have one left, so I'm going to keep this thing around maybe for demonstration purposes. Here's the Astrotech AT72ED. This is the version one. You've seen this here before. Much better telescope, I think, than it's given credit for, especially in Mark II version. And at the very end, I had this last time, but I forgot I had it. This is the Orion Executive Brass Mini Telescope. Oh yes, look at the red silk. In their advertisements, they always talked about the red silk, and I have to admit, half the reason I bought this thing was to see the red silk. <laughs> because it is made of brass, this is a lot heavier than it may look on camera, and it actually works. I mean, this is okay. The eyepieces are non-standard and the flimsy little legs. A few years ago, I used to have this thing pointed at the mailbox. I have a fairly long driveway and it's hard to see if the mail has come. So if I had something that I was mailing and the flag was up, I had this thing permanently pointed at the flag so that I could periodically go into the living room and look through it to see if the mail had in fact come that day. Hey, look, anytime you can put a telescope to use, you've done a good thing. And here is the AP130 GT. This is the F6.3 version, one of the later versions of the AP130. About a year ago, a very kind gentleman out of the Midwest contacted me. He said, I'm getting on and I'm never going to use this thing again. Do you want this? We worked out a price. It arrived about a week later. And this is the Heirloom Telescope. Ironically, I've hardly gotten a chance to use it because, again, I don't have a mount. The CGE died and I don't trust this thing on it. I am using other people's mounts, but I don't want to keep borrowing stuff. So at some point I am going to have to do something about the mount situation. But yes, this is the heirloom telescope. How many is that? I don't know. I'm going to go back through and count them. As I was doing this video, there were more of these than I expected. I thought the collection was going to be a lot smaller. I kept finding stuff. So Anyway, there you have it, State of the Telescope Collection 2025. Hope you enjoyed watching that. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.